If you are stumbling upon our YouTube channel for the first time, uh, this is Beyond Belief Sobriety. My name is John, and we are a podcast that uh, explores uh, secular options to recovery of, from addiction of all kinds. And we have a various guests. We do at this YouTube channel, and we post uh, podcast episodes wherever you like to download them. Today, I'm excited about our guest. Her name is Tara Boyce, and she is the host of Addic- um, excuse me, on it. Addicted to Recovery an interactive um memoir and uh or an interactive tell me what the name of your podcast please Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful (laughs) i really should have rethought that it's uh, addicted to recovery the interactive memoir there you go a few too many words there you go no it's 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 great um i listened to most of your episodes except for the one you suggested i listened to unfortunately (laughs) but i'll I'll listen to that sometime but basically um so what you do is you 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 have a memoir that you've written you read it and then you talk about it and 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 some of how and sometimes your feelings about it and then you also get um uh, listeners who have written in about pr- other episodes and you will interact with them about that it's just really a neat format um you're a you're a voice actor is that right well i haven't started to do it full time yet but okay. i'm i'm working on the craft i have a background in acting and i'm trying okay. to leverage that in a way that i haven't i haven't let my dreams die and so i've i've got a few gigs there and i'm still working on it it well it works really really well um i enjoyed just i enjoyed just the experience of listening to it mm-hmm. and um it was just it was just it's a great experience it, it, it this is a really helpful podcast for somebody that's in recovery Mm -hmm. because you get to hear oh i mean the person who to hear your your you express your own words and then they even talk about how you feel about them to me was a really personal experience that um it was it was just a good experience to have so anyway Mm -hmm. there you go um also you have the most amazing social distancing wardrobe i have ever oh. seen in my life <laughs> that, that was that was me trying to have some fun with covid you know <laughs> yeah that's pretty that's pretty cool i was almost thinking about posting some of those pictures there but anyway okay so let's start off tara by introducing yourself through your story if you don't mind can you t- tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into recovery uh yeah absolutely i I would say that I've been in recovery for about mm, uh, 17 years, but I've only been in successful recovery for two and a half. (laughs) Um, It's a long and sordid, windy road. Actually, it's not that windy. There was a lot of repetition. Um, I started drinking alcoholically when I was about 18. And um, I'm not sure how how far down the path I should go in terms of the story aspect of it, but uh, basically, I feel like I was always um, I always needed something to mediate my life through. I was kind of deeply afraid of life, so there always had to be something. Even before I started drinking, I was very obsessive. Um, it would be, oh my goodness, I have to filter all my emotions through uh, my obsession with this man or um, this idea or um, how I feel about my body. And then alcohol just worked better than all of those things because it directs it so directly affects your brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and it allowed me to be a person that wasn't me. And the more I used it, the less I could show up to life without it. And the less I could interact with anybody or anything without it. And at a point I couldn't interact with myself without it. So I, I needed it to, um, I didn't know who I was without it. So I started drinking alcoholically at about 18. Yeah. And the first time I ever went to get help for it was when I was 20 and I only got sober for more than a couple of months when I was 35. Wow. So, um, so the funny thing about recovery in, in my case is that what I feel makes me qualified to talk about it is just how epically I failed at it for such a long time. Um, (laughs) um, I have many, many, many years at failure in, in recovery and, many different experiences, going to rehabs, going to hospitals, um, trying to 
make it work in 12 step communities. And also it's almost like there were two people uh, showing up to those things. There was one person who really, really wanted to get sober and another person who was doing her damnedest to undermine all those, all those attempts to get sober, who was scheming and lying and redirecting that addictive energy towards um, inappropriate relationships. And um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure how detailed you want me to get about it. Well, that's it. fine. But you, you did mention that um, one, one thing that, that one reason that you wanted to get into the podcast is that a lot of the stories that we hear in recovery, they seem to be pretty linear that, you know, mm -hmm. I started drinking, my life went downhill, and then I got in recovery and everything was great. But mm. they don't really talk about a lot of them don't really talk about the ups and downs along the way. And yeah. you've had some of those. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes. So many. And uh, particularly when I, I used to read a lot of recovery memoirs myself. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of them did follow that kind of structure. It's like rock bottom and then things get better. Um, but in my case, I had so many different bottoms and things maybe would get a little better, but then they would get worse and then they would get a little better and then they would get worse. And then it was just, everything was just a bottom. I was just kind of like living in a proverbial basement apartment of life. Um, and I feel like there can be a lot of a lot of stigma about about relapse and you hear a lot of things like, oh, I guess you just weren't ready yet or you don't want it enough or you're not trying hard enough or particularly in a lot of 12 step recoveries, maybe you're not um, open minded enough to some oh, of the ideas and it can be really crippling to a person who I mean, I didn't go to rehab as many times as I did because I wanted to keep drinking. Maybe at the beginning I was doing it a little bit for show. Um, but generally I was dealing with also some concurrent mental health challenges and it really felt like being locked in with a person who was trying to sabotage all my best efforts at getting well. Um, and I tried to extract, okay, well, what was the lesson every time I relapsed? I would ask myself, you know, was it, what was it? Was it, you know, is it just that I didn't want it enough? Am I not smart enough? Did I not do a good enough job at filling out those worksheets at rehab? Mm -hmm. Like, did I, um, and I would overanalyze it so much, but I found it very difficult at a point because I kind of got addicted to being in rehab right. because I didn't know how to take care of myself anymore. And that whole that whole structure too became its own vicious cycle but i feel like what what a big takeaway for me is that if you can make the same mistake so many times and then somehow manage to make new mistakes that are still kind of the mm -hmm. same as the old mistakes and yet still change yeah eventually yeah. you know that it's not it's not insurmountable um yeah, you know, I, I, I sometimes, um, well, not I, I, I've seen a lot of people um, come back from a relapse in 12-step programs, and um, they just, I, they just sometimes people just, they are too hard on themselves. It's like, okay, mm. I'm back at square one. I need to start oh. all over again. Like, you know, you like, you know, no, you haven't, you haven't forgotten everything that you learned. In mm -hmm. fact, this is just going to maybe get you even further. Um, you know, if you think about recovery, it's nothing more than a process of change and steady improvement, maybe over time. And, you know, a, a relapse doesn't have to be um, deadly. And, and it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong, or you're not doing anything's right. And um, it's just, so I, I think it's, I think it's important that that we do talk about that for some times, you know, um, and recovery too, uh, for me, um, I didn't have a relapse, but I wasn't really happy, you know, mm. for a long time in my recovery. Uh, and I would tell people that, you know, I'm, I, I'm really miserable, but I'm not drinking. And that's all I care about, <laughs> which was kind, of, which, which kind of the, kind of the truth. I mean, I, I was at the point where I just, you know, just don't throw me in jail and, and, oh. and, and I, and I, and I'm okay, you know, but, um, I, 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 I kind of went past that, but I guess it's just, um, important it's important for me i guess i learned from that is that i don't have to judge my recovery just 
based upon how I'm feeling at any given time Mm -hmm. that all of the, all these feelings kind of pass. And I do learn from them as well. It's the thing about being in recovery for me. It's like a learning process. Oh, absolutely. And I feel as though there's this false idea that uh, I'm not sure if anyone gives them to us, but not even just people in recovery, but people in general, that there is this uh, state of of happiness or almost right. self-actualization that you're going to arrive at. And then you're just sort of there, like right. atop the mountain and you're there and no more work to do. You're done. Right. Um, and that that is so that is that is so not the case in yep. any way. And I I also felt like for me, anytime I had the opportunity to uh, go back to rehab or try again, there was this need to prove how much better I was feeling just because mm-hmm. I was sober. Mm-hmm. And this need to be like, I'm so grateful to be sober. I'm so grateful to be sober. But meanwhile, I was just like, so tangled up inside, but I was trying to, um, I was trying to say the words. And I didn't really know what they meant. Mm-hmm. Um, and also this idea that if you don't get something, like if you don't feel something in recovery, then that means that you're, it's not real for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And what, what I've really started to understanding is started understanding is chasing certain states and chasing a state of, of, of happiness or a certain feeling is what I was doing all the time in my alcoholism. And what I feel like most people are doing on a lower level with just, you know, well, what's the next thing I'm going to buy? What's the next person who's going to like my photo? We have this very uh, dopamine receptive society. Oh and we? yeah, absolutely. And, but all states are impermanent. And mm-hmm. the state of, of, happiness is fleeting and misery is fleeting and everything is fleeting and i can't compare how i think that i should be feeling to how i'm actually feeling because that's just a a recipe for disaster but it's tough because we do have lows in recovery as well and um i felt for a long time that if i admitted that it was sort of delegitimizing me as someone who was in recovery or that it meant that I was doing something wrong, especially within the 12 step fellowship. And I'm, I'm not blaming them no. for this. I feel like this was a lot of pressure I was putting mm-hmm. on myself that I really wanted to be a person in recovery. And I had to feel a certain way all the time. Right. Right. So in some of your episodes, you mentioned something and, and I was telling you before we started recording that, that, that there was something in particular about your story that touched me. And, um, I'll tell you what it is. It, it, it I th- was your friend's name. Fr- is it Rin? Uh, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, not the real name, but yeah. okay. Okay. So, um, boy, when you were talking about your, um, how, how you, um, how her death, her suicide impacted you, um, that's, that was, uh, so moving for me. Um, so my story is that, uh, when I was 21 years old, my mother committed suicide. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, um, shortly after her death, uh, someone offered me a shot of whiskey Mm. and yeah. And it immediately, it immediately made me feel better or it made me not feel what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And that put my drinking into a whole new stratosphere Mm. because I had, I had her suicide that I blamed myself for. And you talked about that in some of your episodes, I had the guilt from that, the replaying, I should have known, I should have seen, blah, blah, blah. And the stigma of her death that we never would talk about it. Mm. So that was just like a recipe for me. And so when you, yeah, I know it's horrible. (laughs) But when you were, when you were talking about your feelings about, you know, wishing that you could have seen or whatever, it just, it just brought back for me very deeply those feelings that I've had and my, and her death was a long, long, long time ago, but it's like you, they never really fully go away. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking about that experience and how you've kind of worked through that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I feel that for me, that was also very much the tipping point. Uh, one of my, one of my dearest friends in the world had been struggling with her mental health pretty much as long as I knew her. But I really 
it really blindsided me um, when she took her own life. And I was her closest friend. She didn't have many friends towards the end. And so I felt a heavy burden that I really had, I really, I had really failed her because, and I was drinking pretty heavily at the time already, but it was more social. Yeah. Um, it was more to allow, be with other people. But after that happened, I, I felt like I was just being assaulted by so many feelings that I, of, of guilt, but also yeah. there was a certain survivor's guilt too, of feeling yeah. like, like, and, and not feeling worthy of grieving in a weird yeah. way too, oh, that, gosh, yes. that who am I to, to, to feel all these feelings of missing her and wishing I could have done something when I didn't, when I didn't, when I did nothing. And I obviously know now that, um, you know, I, I, I'm fairly certain I couldn't have done anything, Right. but it's odd because things like that are nuanced because no, I don't, she had a very um, explicit plan that was, you know, executed weeks in advance she had pre she had letters that anyways it was executed mm -hmm. very well in advance um and i don't think i would have been able to intervene in any meaningful way but i also knew that i could have been a better friend at that time because i was very preoccupied with drinking and partying so it was it was oddly nuanced in that way and i started drinking just all the time because I realized, oh, wait, you know, the feelings that I don't want to have when I go out yep. to a party and I don't want to worry about people judging me, I don't have to have those when I'm by myself either. And my voices in my head are judging me and telling mm -hmm. me that, it, you know, and it was, it was such a dark place of having all these, um, all this crippling regret and also feeling unworthy of the regret and, um, I also moved out for the first time all by myself at that time. It was bad, bad timing for mm -hmm. that. And when I realized it worked, when I realized I could just sort of drink steadily throughout the day and just not feel my feelings. And I was also very young at the time, 18, yeah. 19. So my body was pretty resilient. So I could functionally yeah. do that, um, sort of. Hmm. I mean, I think I thought I was more functional than I was. See, I relate so well to that because I was, I was right around the same age, yeah. had the same reaction. I think, I think, I think it was like really subconscious for me that I wasn't really understanding what I was doing, but, I, but looking back, I can certainly see that, no, I understood that alcohol was medication for me. It was my way of dealing with yeah. the, the pain and the trauma that I experienced uh, as a result of, of her death and not dealing with it in any way no yeah. you know so that that yeah so that when you talked about that in your uh, in those uh, and you mentioned her in a couple of episodes um i just want to let you know that that meant a lot to me to hear that uh because you don't really hear uh people talking about that it's a difficult subject to talk about you know and yeah. um yeah so thank you so much for that oh like all i wanted to do with uh the podcast and the memoir in general was to be transparent about hard things that I've been through. So maybe somebody else will be like, can see themselves in it the way that, you know, I often felt when I met, wrote, read yep. <laughs> other people's memoirs and especially something that's hard to talk about. And, and right. it is hard to talk about because I also don't want to, I don't want to make it seem that I am blaming her for my alcoholism. Right. Um, right. Because I'm not. It was no. a cat it was a catalyst, certainly, to uh, making it go from I drink too much to I'm drinking alcoholically every day. And it, it made that leap happen faster. Mm -hmm. But I was already on the way. Right. Same it here. would have taken something else. So it could have been something Absolutely. else. Absolutely. You know? Same. Um, yep. a boyfriend could have broken up with me and I exactly. could start getting the bottle in the morning. It just happened yep. to be something that was just Yep. really awful no i totally um, relate the same exact exact same thing yeah. but you know a podcasting um a podcast is a real intimate experience for the listener uh you know when i, I was listening to you and you have such a great voice and you and, and and it's just the it's just perfect the sound that's that's coming and I, I listened from the first episode, several episodes, and 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 I'm noticing that you just are getting more and more comfortable 
And as a listener, it's just a it's just a very very um, intensely um, intimate experience to listen to you share your story, and I'm just hearing it here in my in my head. It's just me and you, and you're talking you're talking to me. So when you share something that a listener can relate to, you know, for me it was a it was a good feeling. I mean, yes, yes, the feelings are sad, but it's good for me to feel that sadness, you know. Mm -hmm. It, which is what's kind of an odd thing to say, but for me, it's good because that was the, those were the feelings that I was suppressing for so long, I guess. So yeah, it's a, it's a very intimate experience. And, and I wonder how doing this podcast has impacted your own recovery, especially when you get feedback from listeners. You know, um, what you just said and what the feedback I've, I've received from a few people makes me feel like I'm doing something right in a way that I haven't felt in, in a really long time. And it also makes me, it gives me a sense that everything that I went through has, has a purpose in a way that if I can leverage it in a way that is therapeutic or helpful to somebody else, then it wasn't just time that I threw away. You know, it wasn't just, I can, I can recycle it into something of value, you know? Um, and it's also tied up though with, uh, see a lot of when I was doing the podcast, I like to think in terms of when I think about things like, you know, character defects of how can I use the things that can be a liability for me and turn them into something beneficial. Mm -hmm. So I'm naturally kind of verbose and over analytical and in my head a lot. And that can be a huge liability, but I figure it can also be a huge strength because maybe I can excavate something in myself that somebody else doesn't have the words for. And I can put it out there in a way that can assist someone else in their recovery. And it really, and it's kind of weird for me to say because I still feel like, who am I to be talking about recovery? I'm yeah. just this kind of fall down drunk. <laughs> Um, not recently, but, right. and it is tied up with a lot of my fears of, um, what other people think about me. And it's a hugely vulnerable process, it is, obviously. It? Um, but I also feel that so much of my alcoholism was tied up with being afraid of everything and particularly how other people are going to perceive me. So, um, a good way of kind of just doing the opposite is I'm just going to put it all out there. Right. You know, like <laughs> kind of take the thing that I fear the most and and look it straight in the face. Yeah. And I figure the more I do things that scare me, the more I am I'm building the muscles that I didn't have when everything was a reason to drink. Right. Because before like, you know, I stubbed my toe, I, I need to drink. Someone looked right. at me the wrong way. I need to drink. You know, um, you know, one of my eyelashes falls out. I need to drink. You know, like, right. um, so if I can intentionally do things that make me really anxious, <laughs> then it's kind of like building an immunity to that to that anxiety. Yeah. Um, and so it's a lot it's allowing me to grapple with my own demons in in a lot of ways there. Um, but I feel that I really need to feel invested in my recovery and I am still active in 12, uh, 12 step fellowship, but uh -huh. I'm also an introvert and a performer. And if yeah. something is going to be meaningful to me, it kind of has to be, I have to find a way to make it creative, you know, right. that's, that's what kind of, that's what lights me up. And right. I didn't get sober to not be lit up. Right. And if I can somehow merge my creativity, my performativity and my recovery. That's what I was thinking when I started th thought of this whole project. I'm like, well, that's, that's pretty cool for me. Um, I haven't had any terrible negative feedback yet either. So I'm not sure how I would react if that happened, but I feel like I do enough work on myself that I'm able to understand that somebody's coming from, if someone's coming from their life experience and, you know, something that I said activates something in them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, right? No. Um, 
So I had some negative feedback once that I will never, ever forget. Oh, the yeah. Guy, yes. The guy accused the guy said that I'm codependent with my guest. And it's like, oh, no, no, I'm like, no, no, I'm not codependent. I'm just not going to argue with people. You know, and they're sharing their story with me. I mean, goodness gracious, this isn't a debate program. You know, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, anyway, so that was the, the funniest one. But usually I don't get um, um, I don't get much criticism at all. So um, but I will t- also tell you that um, for me, uh, your recovery, your recovery shows also in your sense of humor. So that's, and that's the one thing I love about, um, recovery meetings, 12 step meetings, AA meetings, whatever, is there's always, we have these, we have this, we have this horrible, sad, these sad, like tragic gallows story. Humor. I know, but we can, <laughs> we can laugh and, you know, you have a great sense of humor and, and it shows that, you know, th- that is so important for people to hear. Because mm. it shows that, okay, she has been through hell and now she can talk about it and she can laugh about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I didn't have a sense of humor about myself, I'm fairly certain I wouldn't be here. No. Um, and I would get called out for that in therapy a lot for using it as a defense mechanism or being inappropriate because, um, and maybe it was, but it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I heard I heard this expression once that, you know, if you're going to laugh about it one day, why not today? And yeah, sure. Maybe it was a little inappropriate for, you know, um, waking up in the hospital and making jokes about it to the nurses, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know, seeing the IV and being like, I certainly hope there's liquor in that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So maybe that was a tad inappropriate. But but now I feel like that it it shows that we're all just human beings and we're, we can be so silly sometimes and see, and there, it just, everything just feels so felt so dramatic when I was in it and to be able to step back and have a sense of levity. Um, that's what feel makes me feel free. I more free, I guess, right. being able to laugh at something. Right. Okay. So maybe we should talk about the episode I didn't listen to. Um, you, you, you did, you did mention, and since we, this is kind of what we do here beyond blue mm. sobriety. Um, so, uh, so you, you so you, you're still involved in 12-step programs and um so tell me about the god thing and how, was that was that a problem for you oh oh yes yes absolutely and um i'll i'll take my own inventory in the sense that i feel like i had a very narrow idea of what people mean when they say god i really thought that which showed a sort of lack of respect for other people's intelligence that I literally thought that anyone said who said God was talking about some bearded dude holding a scroll (laughs) who was going to, you know, judge them at the gates and, you know, like that sort of literal uh, religious fundamentalist thinking, not, not that many people actually subscribe to, but um, I feel like it's a lot to ask of people when they're having to give up, their most cherished relationship in life often with their drug of choice Mm -hmm. to also ask that they give up their way of seeing reality. And in, in a lot of ways, my, my way of seeing reality was skewed when it came to my relationship with, well, alcohol, people, my body, et cetera. But um, my understanding of how the world works and the metaphysics and um, and religion, spirituality, that wasn't why I drank. I didn't right. drink because I, you know, I read too much Nietzsche. Um, that, that, <laughs> right. that wasn't what did it. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, I picked up a Sam Harris book and I was off to the races. Mm-hmm. But um, and I really felt that when I went into 12 step recovery in the early days, that if I couldn't get myself to think a certain way or feel it was more of a feeling if I couldn't get myself to feel the presence of something inside of me then I had no chance of getting sober and a lot of that was me um projecting outward because you know most of the people I know in AA are pretty open-minded and I can I can talk about my non-theistic approach to spirituality and they're not and they're not mean about it and and but you don't get that idea when you just come in and you hear God, 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 God. And you don't necessarily have anyone translating for you. Right. Like you don't really have anyone to pull you aside and and I mean you can seek that out. But my goodness, when I was going into meetings, 
I didn't know how to talk to people. I certainly didn't know how to challenge, like, be mm -hmm. like, you know, all those, all those weird things that you just read. Like, um, what is, what translate that? Nobody does right, right, that necessarily right. when you walk in. Um, and it would be nice if, you know, perhaps there was a way to make it more inviting to secular people on the surface because you right. can have a really great experience there as a secular person just in terms of uh the community and also the steps themselves are sure. are, are pretty decent there's a lot of sure. good good stuff in there stuff that borrows obviously from christianity but also sure. there's echoes of buddhism in there there's echoes of stoicism in there with the inventory and there's some good solid sort of cbt based mm -hmm. stuff that yeah, is there a good is, thing isn't there? to do and the mentorship program i think is wonderful yep. with sponsorship but there's also just this feeling that if you didn't get it then you're doing something wrong and it made me and i don't want to say it because you know right. 12 step is not just one thing there's no That's the there's, thing it depends so on what group you go to on what day yeah and there's and i've met most of my favorite people in in 12 step meetings but um there is a sort of pr problem as a whole where yeah. um when you come in it feels like it's really on you to bend and twist your um your mind to accept a kind of higher higher right. power of your own understanding but then in the book it says that you have to pray to that higher power so right. what understanding because that seems like a very specific understanding um so it was confusing to me and I tried hard to, we were speaking of Maria Hornbacker before, and yes. I tried to get through um, her version of the steps in the book, uh, Waiting. Yes. And that helped me quite a bit in terms of understanding that I could come to terms with agnosticism as its own form of spirituality. Right. And that really, really helped me. And there's some other books that even Russell Brand's book, Recovery, uh -huh. helped me navigate through the 12 steps. I still steps. haven't read that one. Yes, but, it's good. But, it's mm -hmm. good. But I guess the problem is if you have to do so much translating with the basic text, um, I feel that once you kind of get it, once you're sort of mm -hmm. in recovery for a while and you're doing well, you can sort of have this wink, wink, nudge, nudge with the right. other people in the rooms about, oh, yeah, okay, well, they say God and we, we're all okay with it. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. And even if it does for some people, sure. But, you know, that's that's people who are already sober and they're doing well. So I feel like there's a lot of preaching to the choir that happens, but not enough kind of um, bringing newcomers into the fold and sort of letting them know that they uh, were not there to convert them and right. there's not going to be some sort of a weird culty indoctrination thing and maybe there will be because once again every single group is different that's the thing but, that's mm -hmm. the thing you can't really define like yeah. AA because it really depends on the group mm. who might happen to be there that day exactly. I mean, i've heard all exactly. kinds of crazy stuff in AA meetings mm -hmm. and i've also heard some wonderful stuff too so it's, yeah it's, it's not there's not like one AA where this is just the way it is. Exactly. Or, it can be just... different. And I go to one meeting, I go to another one across the street. It's a, a very different vibe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's so there's, there's definitely not just sort of one way of going about it. No, no. But I, I also feel though, that like, if you are in recovery and you want to have a strong recovery community, 12 step is kind of where the meat and potatoes are there. Right. But I don't feel like the burden should be on the newcomer to do all the work. Not everybody right. has it in them to read as many variations right, of 12 right. step books as I did. And some people don't have the time. I just don't right. know why I'm not dead. Right. You know, like I just, I just don't really understand. And it's like, Oh, end up in the hospital. I'm going to read another one of these 12 step books mm -hmm. and see if it, see if it sticks, you know, but some yeah. people don't also, I live in Canada. Uh -huh. Right. So I was able to go to rehab 12 times. Okay. Um, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so not everyone has the luxury of, of working through their own um, prejudices and misconceptions. Uh, and a lot of people will just go and hear God a lot and run away and never come back. And that's sad because there is a lot of value to be found there. Um, there is, you know, and I've, and I've come to understand the steps is just, um, wording um, mm -hmm. and it happened to be some the the lang language of some people from long ago that's how they described their recovery mm -hmm. but when you really get down to uh the experiences and the actions that were taken you can really see that okay yeah i had this experience but i just describe it differently mm -hmm. and i've done these things but it 
for me, it was a little bit less mystical. It was a little mm. more practical, you know, and I'm very comfortable with that. But yeah, uh, a new person might look at that and and uh, and it's really hard to see beyond the those words. I remember the first time I saw the words, it kind of surprised me. I, said, well, I didn't know there was so much God involved here. Mm. But, but my thing was I could, it wasn't that difficult for me because the, first of all, there were a lot of people telling me not to worry about it. There are a lot mm. of good people telling me don't worry yeah. about it. And also I kind of just kind of learned how to, how to kind of talk the language. There's a real language. There's a language. Exactly, you know, yeah. I it's kind of like it. the, 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 <laughs> the lingo of recovery, you know, there's yeah. like music jargon, there's like techno tech jargon, and this is kind of like recovery jargon and it's yeah. often 12 step based. So, um, that's why I, I do feel like it's a, a, a good idea to have a foot in the community as it were, because it's just a really big community, but, um, it's accessible Adogmatism. and you can always add others to other things to it as well. Yeah. But I, I feel that, you know, there is a certain level of, 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 you know, I, I mean, I'm not the authority on anyone else's recovery. Right. And that's another thing I always insist on in, in the podcast is that I know my experience and what was hard for me and what worked for me. And even when I did my latest episode on 12 step communities, I'm really just trying to troubleshoot and unpack the things that were difficult for me. Right. And, make it and hopefully help someone else who might be struggling with the same things. But, you know, I, I don't want to be saying, you know, 12 step is this or that or the other thing. Um, but I do know that I did struggle with some of the steps just in terms of the, uh, the content as well, because I may have an overblown ego, but it's not in, I don't think it's in the same way as, as, no. as it was for Bill and Bob. I feel like it's more in a um, internalized, obsessive, self-critical. Right. So even take the inventory steps. I think doing an inventory in theory is good, but doing an inventory where I'm asking myself, what did I do wrong today? Right. You know, I, my brain can come up with reasons why I'm doing something wrong every second of the day at all times. Right. So, um, so yeah, so I guess I, I feel like there should be a welcome package that right, people get yeah. when, when they walk in the door, you know, like all those pamphlets that they have mm -hmm. that nobody ever reads, but there should be a whole bunch of different ones that it's like, Hey, you can try this book too. And if, and if you're worried about this, here's some things that you can, uh, but yeah. nothing's perfect. And I don't no. run the role. I don't run the world. No. And I, I do, I do think that I do think it's kind of, I think it's kind of improving now because uh, one reason I think COVID in a way is mm. kind of helping somewhat because now we're, we're able to, um, um, go to meetings outside of um, Kansas City. I don't think it's going to be easier. I could go anywhere I want to in the world, you know. And, yeah. and you're meeting people with different ideas than than you might hear from your own local home group. And I think that I think that that has helped in a lot of ways with the recovery community and people realizing that you know that that there there are other options and ways of of understanding uh, recovery and talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I've gone to meetings in many different places. I've gone to some secular meetings. I've gone to some Buddhist meetings. I've yeah. gone to, um, uh, yeah, meditation based meetings, like a whole bunch of different types. Yeah. And so it's really cool how kind of like the core is still present in a lot of ways. But right. for me, um, as much as I, can rail on about how mad the G word made me right. and how I'd come to, but it really, when I felt all this pressure to come to find a higher power of my own understanding, it did really propel me into a sort of spiritual seeking right. where I wanted to know, you know, how do I live life in a way that is meaningful and ethical with wisdom and integrity and to, have a good relationship with myself and other people and um, live in alignment with values that before I was over, I didn't even know that I had. So that's how spirituality kind of took shape for me as a kind of ethical seeking. Yeah. And I'm really grateful to the fact that I was unable to find God because I feel like it's easy to kind of have this moment and kind of stop there. Mm -hmm. But for me, I was I'm grateful for the fact that I didn't find, you know, unless he's hiding under my right, right. desk somewhere, but because it gave me a sort of hunger for growth. 
that right. I still have. I don't feel like I've arrived at the answer. And just as sort of like you were talking about with uh, happiness before, I don't feel like there will ever be a time where I will arrive at an answer. But right. I love the process of of seeking and changing and uh, appreciating wisdom from all sorts of different disciplines as well. And if it wasn't for the 12 steps and if it wasn't for me being a darn perfectionist who wanted to prove to everyone how spiritual I was, <laughs> um, it wasn't for my darn ego, actually, I, I wouldn't have done as much reading. I wouldn't have done as much exploration. I wouldn't have tapped into certain parts of me I didn't even know were there. So it just kind of gave me a hunger. And my spirituality is very much about agnosticism because if the moment I think that I know anything, the moment I stop learning, Right. Right. And geez, I don't I don't know anything, really. I certainly don't know how what governs the universe. Right. I don't even know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> right. So I wanted to ask you, um, so how you do this podcast? So um, do you is your memoir, is it written already and complete? And is it like published and writing somewhere where you can read it? Or are you writing and then putting that out on your podcast? Mm, well, I think the jig is probably somewhat up by now. I, it was mostly written, I would okay. say, or I thought it was mostly written okay. when I started doing when I started doing the podcast. Um, but then, as I started doing the podcast, I started reflecting on some of what I had written yeah. and realizing that oh that doesn't really fit here because i had this whole long drawn out childhood section that i haven't really that i haven't really put in because i don't know it just didn't seem in like it fit in a lot of mm -hmm. ways or i don't know i thought people would get impatient with it um so i kind of put a lot of that on the back burner and then as i started going going through some of the chapters i'm like well there's this huge gap here that i didn't think was important because you know, of where I was when I was writing it. But then I started reflecting and thinking, well, this is important. So I did write additional chapters and there are some gaps here that here and there. But um, also as I've continued to change and reevaluate, uh, the, the past didn't change, but as right. I change, my perspective on it changes. And also as I formatted the podcast, a lot of the episodes have to do with, okay, well, yes, sure, I'm an alcoholic, but how did that manifest through the lens of my concurrent mental health struggles? Or how did that manifest right. through the lens of my uh, struggles with um, eating behaviors? Or how did that manifest through the lens of, of 12 step fellowship membership? Or how did that manifest through intimate relationships? Right. And as I kind of started structuring them a little bit more like that, that made me have to take borrow a little from here, slap it there, do a little copy paste, do a little. So I'm kind of doing a lot of patchwork with it as it goes. But I think that's great. It is. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's a, you, you, first of all, you're an amazing writer. The oh, writing, the writing is really, really, really good. Oh, it's and not then, edited at all. So I'm oh my gosh. Like, mm, and then the, well, the, the, the delivery is perfect. Your delivery mm -hmm. is perfect. It's just mm -hmm. a, it's just an amazing experience. But what is so cool about it is you you'll, you'll go through this. Um, I, I think you're you're reading it right, but then you talk about it and you talk about how even you feel about it. Like mm. you, you you would say to the listeners that I know this might be hard for you to hear. It's hard for me. Yeah, for yeah. you to hear <laughs> when you when you write about. Like I'm talking it. about myself, but I still want to hear. I still, I still don't want to hear about that. <laughs> it's it's very it's very unique. You've got a really unique thing going there, and I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of your podcast, and I'm gonna recommend it to people because it's just it's just really 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 well done. It's Thank really you. really well done. Thank you. So. Well, I think I made it up. Like the whole idea, I don't think anybody else is doing that so. i don't think so uh, i don't I, think so it's really cool i think i made up the concept so that's cool. <laughs> it's yours but, but yeah and with the constraints of a, a traditional book too i feel like um if i did just write it all down and try to get it published uh the traditional route I wouldn't be able to do all this stuff that I'm doing now with it. And also yeah. it would be sort of like, okay, well, that is, that is the last word. That is what I think about that. But if I do this podcast indefinitely, of course I might run out of material from my past, but um, I'll always be able to draw on it or even refer back to old things and be like, well, you know, I think I have something different to say about that now. And cause I don't think that I'm, you know, I'm done in terms of growing no. and changing it at two and a half years. And, uh, releasing it in a podcast form allows me to interact with it differently myself and right. also bring in, cause a memoir generally is kind of supposed to be about one thing. 
Um, and it allows me to bring in, okay, well, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about that too, because it doesn't, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a great experience. It's a great experience as a listener. And I can see how it would also help help you to learn about it. And what's going to be really interesting for you is if you keep doing this for a few years is to look back <clears throat> on some previous episodes and say, yeah, you know, I that's how I used to see that. But I don't quite see it that way now, you know, and yeah. that's, what, that's what I've noticed with with um, with doing this is I'll look back like five years ago. It's like, you know what? I know I said that, but that, I don't know. That, that's not exactly how I see it now. Yeah. You know, so it's it, you get to see your own growth and how you how you you evolve too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it allows you to re like reflect back on it and keep it. It's yeah. it's more it's more of an alive experience. Yeah, I, I feel like it's almost like an organism that I can keep feeding, um, which is which is which is cool. But it also I also have to be cautious of putting all my eggs in one proverbial basket too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In that I I am very obsessive and you know I. This podcast needs to be part of my recovery, but it can't replace the other normal human things like, you know, talking to people and doing the dishes. And <laughs> That is really a good point. And I have to remind myself of that, too, especially mm -hmm. since COVID, because um, I, you know, I'm not going to face to face meetings. And I and I said, you know what, this re this this podcast is really my recovery program. Mm -hmm. And it is to a sense, but I, I still need that human connection. Yeah. And so today I, I ran an errand. I dropped something off to a friend of mine from my home group and I hugged her mm -hmm. and it was the first time since March of 2020 that I hugged anybody from my home group. And it was Aww. so, it was so nice to see her in mm. person and talk to her. And I, I miss that. And Me and too. I was telling her, she said, well, that podcast really keeps you busy. Doesn't it? I said, yeah, but sometimes it can also be a way of, um, it could be a way of hiding mm -hmm. and from, um, people isolating in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of weird. It's like everything. It's uh, it's got a good, it's got a bad. It's, it's a little bit of balance, I guess I yeah. always need to find. I feel as long as that you're engaging with it, with that awareness of it, you can sort yeah. of keep it in check. Yes. Right. Um, so uh, like in the sense that like it's, it's very easy for me to um, maybe even obscure how I'm feeling if I'm behind a microphone reading something that is scripted. But this, right. for example, this is, this terrified me completely <laughs> because yeah. I'm, I'm off book. Mm -hmm. I don't have the security of being able to go back and edit it. I don't have the security of, and it made me realize how, um, how I was sort of reverting back to certain behaviors of really wanting to control everything and really wanting to, um, and, and really wanting to just sort of be by myself where I can control the outcome of yeah. things. Yeah. You know? um, but something like just talking to you now is such a different experience because there's another person and I'm not, you know, and, and that, that's scarier in a way than, um, than putting out a product, you know, that's mm -hmm. done. <laughs> Well, you do, you do it really well. And the podcast, I'm going to get it right, is Addicted to Recovery and Interactive Memoir. Uh, the Interactive Memoir. The Interactive Memoir. And I'm <laughs> so I sorry. I, I, I'm okay. like, why am I'm, I having such a I'm hard time with I'm rethinking the title. Like, <laughs> no, don't. Maybe it's just perfect. Make it an acronym. It's, it's, it's perfect. I'm just the dodo, the dumbhead that can't seem to say it for whatever reason. I actually wrote it down, but I wrote it down wrong. Anyway, that's my that's my problem. So anyway, thank you so much, Tara. It was so, it was so great to have you here. Oh, and, it's so uh, wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, I, I'm, t I'm totally going to recommend your podcast to people and I'm going to continue to listen to it. It's just very, very well done. So thank you for bringing it to my attention and oh, for sharing my it. Pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that it, that, that, that it's helpful to you because, um, yeah, it, it, it means a lot to me to just have people talking about recovery and yeah. normalizing it and, and being transparent about the different ways we can be in recovery because there's no one way to be in recovery right. right that's right um but i feel like one thing that is sort of non-negotiable is that it does have to be shared in a way and it does have to be brought to the light and right yeah. right okay so that will be a wrap <laughs> This is Beyond Belief Sobriety. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. 
If you would like to support our podcast, you can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, go over to our website, beyondbeliefsobriety.com, and click on the donate button or buy us a cup of coffee. In fact, Tara has a buy, buy us a cup of coffee page too, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you should go there and, and help her out too as well. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com. Is it yeah, slash eight, beyond belief sobriety. Anyway, help us out if you can. If you can't, that's okay too. Thank you so much for listening and thank you, Tara, for being here. I really appreciate it.